Welcome everyone to today's Grand Rounds. I hope your day has been going well. My name is Kina and I will be your host for today. Before we get started, I would like to go over a little housekeeping. This presentation is recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And if you wish to watch it later, you can just, there will be a link at the end and you might click it and watch it whenever you're free. There is an option named playback speed to adjust the speed of the presentation for those interested in watching it later. There are also features on Zoom that enable closed captions that will follow our speaker. So if you wish to have captions on during the presentation, feel free to turn those on. It's called closed captions. It will be on the bottom bar of the Zoom channel. Lastly, we will be enabling a Zoom summary, which is a feature that summarizes the entire presentation through an AI. So if anyone is uncomfortable and prefers not to have the summary feature, please let us know either by unmuting or putting it in the chat. All right, then. Then without further ado, let us begin today's presentation by Dr. Twina Masiko. I will now hand it over to Dr. P, our moderator, to continue pr the presentation. Thank you, Kina. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the new year. I'm Dr. Gregory Pekia, Medical Director of Global Offsite Care and the Global Grand Round Series. Uh, we're excited to have this morning um, a, uh, our first guest in 2024, Dr. Bruce Tuinama Siko. Uh, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, apologies for uh, any uh, mistakes on your name, but uh, uh, glad to have you here. And uh, uh, a little bit about Dr. Tuinama Siko. Uh, he is a uh, Ugandan-trained physician with a Master of Medicine and Internal Medicine from uh, Mbarara University, Uganda, postgraduate diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene from London University, and a certificate in cardiovascular disease prevention from Harvard, uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, he worked with the Church of Uganda, Kazizi, hospital for three years and then joined Kabbalah University Medical School for three years and has recently concentrated on implementing solutions for healthcare challenges in southwestern Uganda through Medica startups. He received mentorship training uh, through short-term rotations at the Uganda Heart Institute and hands-on support through visiting cardiology uh, mentor Dr. Angus Nightingale from the Bristol Heart Institute in the UK. He's also had uh, hands-on training in GI endoscopy at uh, uh, Roya Training Center in Egypt. A little bit about his interests. He's been finding uh, sustainable solutions for issues affecting public health and is engaged in research to address cardiovascular disease burden and has uh, made publications in peer-reviewed peer journals on this. Uh, he is uh, implementing solutions for improving access to high quality specialty care in Western Uganda. And this is being implemented through the Medicus Health Care's uh, specialized clinics. Currently, uh, he's involved in operating two clinics in Southwestern Uganda. These have become focal points for access to a range of services, which used to be hard to find. Uh, he, uh, his group has implemented telehealth in these facilities and over 10,000 uh, clients uh, have benefited mostly with non-communicable diseases uh, that, and have been recruited for follow-up. Uh, we are thinking, uh, his group is thinking of implementing telemedicine innovations to bridge gaps in access to quality health care in rural southwestern Uganda. People used to travel over 500 kilometers to Kampala in search of services such as uh, endoscopy, echocardiography, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, they are now able to access quality health care closer to home, uh, thereby cutting costs on health care and creating convenient health care and improving treatment outcomes. Uh, on the personal side, uh, Dr. Bruce is married to Eleanor Tengoma and uh, has one child, 
um, Griella, uh, who at the moment, um, uh, currently, and uh, also is a um, acoustic guitar player. So maybe if we have any time at the end of this uh, uh, session, uh, maybe we can hear a, a tune, um, if that is possible. Anyway. Dr. Twina Masinko, uh, thank you so much for coming today, and I'll hand it over to you to get started. Um, by the way, we'll have some questions, um, uh, time for Q&A at the end of the session, and uh, also for those who may wish to uh, pose questions in the chat, uh, that would be fine as well, and we will have this posted, um, as Kina said, uh, for uh, review and uh, CME can be obtained uh, up, up to a week after the session if uh, you so choose. So with that, uh, Dr. Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peck here. I hope I pronounced it rightly. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, I want to thank every other person who is listening, who is tuned in to this very first uh, presentation. And I'm delighted and excited to be the very number one presenter in 2024. It's exciting. Yeah, I want uh, to take us uh, through a case that I personally have been engaged in and managing a young girl. It's 24 years old that I think I called uh, juvenile polyposis syndrome. So she, I, I think clinically she does have juvenile polyposis syndrome. And then, of course, the worst bit of it is this had progressed to colorectal cancer. And that will be taking us through uh, the case presentation. Uh, it, I come uh, in the other introduction, I come from. Uh, Uganda, and uh, Uganda is in East Africa, and I come specifically from southwestern Uganda. This part of Uganda is close to Rwanda, and uh, when you come to this beautiful place, you won't want to miss uh, visiting this lake with several uh, a beauty. It's called Lake Bunyonyi. I will be waiting for all of you to come and visit. And then when you come to this part of Uganda, you won't miss to see uh, mountain gorillas at Buindi. And then uh, this is an, an amateur picture of uh, me, myself and uh, some of the colleagues that I work with at the very startups that Dr. Pe Pekia uh, talked about. And yeah, we start with demographics. Uh, presenting KE, uh, who is a 24-year-old female, uh, she comes from a district close to where I am currently, it's Kisoro. It's around uh, around 40 kilometers from here, where I'm, I am currently. She came in, uh, reported to us, told us she wasn't married, and uh, she's a Catholic by religion, and she came, she told us that she had two uh, presenting complaints, the major complaints, one was passage of large stool for around one year, and the other uh, very important issue that she presented with was anal pain, and this, she had had it for around four months. In this part of the world, we usually want to be sure that whoever comes to us, especially in the internal medicine unit, we want to know whether they are HIV positive or not, because that guides our thinking. So she reported to us that she had tested for HIV, so HIV is human immunodeficiency virus, and she was uh, HIV uh, negative. And she didn't have, before the onset of this current uh, bothering symptoms, she had not had any known uh, chronic illness. And the chronic illnesses would be uh, like maybe diabetes, like sickle cell or any other uh, chronic illnesses. And she had had a one-year history of passage of stool, which was strict with 
fresh blood. But before the onset of these symptoms, she had lived most of her life passing waterless stool. And uh, before it became, uh, she started seeing blood, it had been an unbloody and she reported maybe on average she would have like around four motions per day. And because of this, of course, she had been to several facilities and being treated as gastroenteritis, several uh, diagnoses labeled as chronic diarrhea, uh, thinking maybe she may have had like uh, uh, soil related parasites like hermits. And she had had a number of treatments for this chronic uh, uh, diarrhea, but she wasn't getting better. And because of this, she had grown a thin, like lean bodied uh, young girl. But uh, the family, and because they couldn't go further into seeking much more uh, advanced care, they kept on uh, going to the nearby facilities and managing her symptomatically until when she, these uh, symptoms later were sent with now onset of blood strict stool. And this she had had it for around four months before she presented to us. And uh, at around this same time, she started uh, feeling associated abdominal pain, which was more low abdominal pain. And she reported uh, that this seemed to radiate uh, to the back. We kind of thought maybe it was just an association, not that it was a typical uh, like pathophysiological uh, uh, connection with the uh, radiation, but she has well reported uh, associated back pain, lower back pain. And both of this pain, what seemed to exacerbate this pain was when she would be uh, passing stool. She also, around the same time, she occasionally felt a mass protruding through the anal orifice uh, every time she was visiting uh, the washroom. And three months before she came to us, she had seen, and, and this is what really scared her and her family, she, she had passed a round bright red mass uh, per rectum. And then the other associated symptoms, she was getting abdominal fullness every time she ate small feeds. Uh, and uh, she as well, in association with the gastrointestinal system, she reported that she was occasionally getting epigastric pain, but it wasn't associated with other uh, serious red flags like difficulty swallowing, like progressive dysphagia, like hematemesis. So she wasn't, she hadn't noticed any of these associated symptoms. And she reported to us significantly in family history, of course, we wanted to know whether she had any idea of any of her family members having ever had something like this, you know, such symptoms. And she told us she wasn't aware of any family member who ever had such kind of uh, symptoms. Before she came to us, she had been to the closest uh, facility, which is like a district hospital, right, which I said is around uh, 40 kilometers from where I am. And because the symptoms were not improving and this facility didn't have any other additional diagnostics to try and find out what was happening, they sent her to us. Uh, so she was referred for a, a facility where she could uh, hopefully have colonoscopy services. And then she had to come to us. In review, I don't know uh, whether we, I may pause here and do you have any questions so far to the history or I can move on and wait for questions at the end of history. All right, I'll move on. So in review of other systems, she didn't report any history of cough or the worst of it, uh, coughing with uh, sputum, blood streaked. She didn't have any chest pain or report of any difficulty in swallowing, in, in breathing. But she reported that she was uh, frequently feeling dizzy and near or near. 
and she had not uh, missed any uh, she was passing urine normally. It was her index admission she reported to us she had never had any surgical procedures done to her and uh, she had never had any history of blood transfusion. She didn't report to us history of any known drug allergies. She was the last born in a family of six children. Her mother had passed on about 20 years uh, ago. Uh, that's when she was still young and she wasn't aware of relatives that we interacted with were not aware of what killed the mother. And she reported to us that her other siblings are currently okay. She was staying with her dad and she wasn't at school. She's not at school. She was just uh, doing casual work at home. All right, I'll move on. So on examination, she was a young girl. She looked wasted. Uh, she had mild conjunctival and paramapala. She didn't have a scalero yellow wing, which would be jaundice. And uh, the palpation of regional influence, she didn't have any uh, identifiable uh, lymphadenopathy. She had grade three digital clubbing and her vitals on admission. When we saw her, she had a blood pressure. 109 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Her pulse rate was a full volume at 78 beats per minute. Circulating at 97% in room air, she was temperature 36.4 and her respiratory rate was 17 breath per minute. She had normal hair distribution on the head and in the axilla, so she didn't have any stigmata of uh, chronic liver disease. And her abdomen, it was of normal fullness, soft, but she had mild tenderness in the left umbilical region. She didn't have any uh, parapenomases for abdomen. Rectal exam ha had normal perianal region. She didn't have any perianomases. In, in the rectum, they were very tender. It could not go above them, and we noted fresh blood on the examining finger. The cardiovascular system was uh, all uh, findings, normal peripheral flow, regular, full volume, pulse, JVP wasn't raised. Uh, she had a no precordial activity and point of maximum impulse was not dispressed, and she had no more uh, heart sound, this one and this two without any other additional sounds. Respiratory system had a stem trachea, uh, normal chest expansion, had a resonant percussion note, and vesicular breath sounds. Then these are the images of the colonoscopy that we did, and as we can clearly see, on the left of the screen, several uh, polypoid masses close to the uh, rectal uh, junction. And then the screen on the right, it's much more when you move the scope, much more after uh, towards the sigmoid colon. There was, these masses had actually started to stricture, to cause stricture or to narrow, cause narrow of the lumen. And then this, uh, these are images still in the clear images of the several masses polypoid masses uh, in the sigmoid colon and then in the ascending colon on the right. We had uh, additional uh, investigations and for this case, of course, uh, getting a CT scan in this part, uh, it's a little bit, it's, it's not that everyone has the privilege to have it. So she was privileged to have a CT scan done and it showed uh, these findings that we see. It, it uh, told, uh, showed us that she had irregular concentric thickening of the rectal wall uh, with, uh, and the dimensions are about 7.6 centimeters by 1.47 centimeters. There was perirectal fat stranding. She had numerous 
sacral lymph nodes. The masses which were seen on CT scan were anal sphincter sparing. And of course, the CT scan as well demonstrated that she had several polyps in the walls of all coronic segments. She as well had polyps in the stomach. We would have loved to do as well an upper GI endoscopy, but she wasn't able to afford the investigation. She didn't have any masses in the liver and uh, she didn't have any masses in the lung. So when we saw her and we had a, histology, a histological diagnosis after taking off tissue from these masses, we confirmed that it was a uh, well differentiated adenocarcinoma. So we had to link her to oncology, to a clinic. Uh, much closer to us, which takes care of uh, cancer patients. And then when she reached to oncology, she was started on, uh, this is the record of the follow-up that I got from the clinic. She was started on the ad adjuvant chemotherapy with the wall that uh, this can significantly shrink the masses and maybe there could be plan to engage surgeons on uh, possibilities of surgery. She had uh, these ox oxaliplatin and cabecitabine six cycles. And then she was sent to us again to try and see whether there was significant shrinkage of these masses. When we did the colonoscopy, we actually found that there wasn't so much significant shrinkage. In fact, at this point, what looked to be a stricturing, what was the narrowing of the lumen was getting much more narrower and the tumors were much more friable. So we couldn't even go beyond uh, the rectal sigmoid junction because we knew that it was, uh, of course, because of the risk of perforation and the risk of bleeding. So we couldn't go beyond. So it didn't look like uh, the chemotherapy had significantly helped. So this is. Uh, a case, a, a really a real case that we currently have, that we are managing, and we are a little bit stuck with what to do, with what next, what would be the next course of action. Of course, we've engaged uh, surgical teams, and they would, they are talking about a colectomy, but but it's it's we in a dilemma. That's why in the initial uh, title I said that this is one case where we find uh, as clinicians, we, we have a, a kind of a dilemma and we are struggling with what needs to be done at this point. Of course, we can appreciate the fact that it's been a long time. You keep on hoping, we keep on hoping that maybe if this young girl had been uh, diagnosed, had been met much earlier, we would have much more chances to do something, but it's just a very uh, stressful, very uh, painful situation where we have a case, a young girl who is progressed, and then we don't have so many options. We ha don't have so many uh, options at this time. We're not sure of what we can do and what can make her better at this time. And just part of the discussion, uh, the reason I chose this case, it's, it's a clear example. There's so many other cases that we find here because of the very many challenges that are surrounding health in uh, developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's, it's, it's a whole range of system uh, having issues of access having issues of affordability, having issues of equipment, and having issues of uh, skilled personnel. So it's a whole complex. It's a one case which demonstrate, clearly demonstrates what healthy care, the challenges that surround healthy care, and this one case out of the many millions that are having to go through this because of the several challenges that we see. In, uh, in South Saharan Africa and many other uh, developing countries. Thank you. I'll receive questions, comments, additions, and then a need for further clarification. Right. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. That was, uh, if, um, um, 
Yeah, it was absolutely a fascinating case and a great example of um, not only using modern technology to make a diagnosis, but how we might be able to use modern communication technologies, telemedicine, telehealth tools in particular, to address uh, hopefully much earlier um, cases like this yeah. that are rare in nature and are yeah. um, um, otherwise straightforward to diagnose, but to overcome the, uh, the barriers to care uh, that you mentioned. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, while um, some of our other attendees prepare their questions, I'll start with one if that's okay. And uh, uh, specifically, what type of telemedicine or digital medicine strategy might have led to earlier detection and treatment of a rare atypical condition such as this one in, in your experience and uh, also from uh, what I understand you're developing on the ground there in Uganda? Yeah, it's it's a little bit challenging if we have to uh, think through telemedicine uh, because for such a rare kind of uh, illness, we may need to be looking at how we can sensitize the community to make sure they come to facilities early, but whether that is going to involve telemedicine, I am not sure. Uh, of course, so I, I, I am not really confident with application of uh, telemedicine, for example, in this part of the world to aid early diagnosis, especially when we still have gaps with uh, sensitization at community level and when we as well have gaps with access and then we have gaps too with uh, getting skilled personnel and getting equipment. Yeah, so uh, I, I, that's why I get a little bit challenged on how this uh, novel strategy, like telemedicine, may be able to bridge the gaps that we are seeing. Great, great. Um, well, yeah, specifically um, trying to, uh, you know, help address, again, um, presentation of anything, uh, rare conditions or common conditions, early on using simple, straightforward telemedicine um, hardware and software tools, really just starting with the smartphone and uh, making the assumption, maybe incorrectly, that even in somewhat rural areas that may have intermittent connectivity, that there might be the availability of uh, something like a smartphone for an individual mm -hmm. or maybe for a small medical type facility uh, or a community facility in even small villages, is it possible to organize a kind of an outreach that's uh, based even on uh, AI chatbots, uh, essentially something like taking this case, which I, I took the liberty of putting this case, just posing a question to chat GPT, you know, not even really being specific to medical, uh, but just the general... Uh, chat GPT. So I put the, I entered this question in uh, to chat GPT uh, stating uh, a 24 year old female with a one year history of rectal fullness, bleeding and loose stools. And the answer was uh, from chat GPT, I'm not a doctor, but those <laughs> symptoms could be related to various issues like hemorrhoids, inflammatory bowel disease, or other gastrointestinal conditions. It's crucial to con consult with a healthcare professional for a proper diagnosis and advice on further steps. Uh, not, not exactly uh, rocket science uh, per se, but potentially transformative for an um, individual like this who perhaps even a year before, 
might have been able to simply interact with something like a smartphone that could uh, reply with uh, simple instructions, which is something's wrong with you. Uh, and mm. this is the this is the time to reach out to a healthcare professional, whether it be a healthcare worker, um, a family member, uh, or someone who may have some additional interest and incentive to go ahead and move things forward for this patient and start the diagnostic process uh, with a more yeah. detailed history and then you know, beginning to think about the logistics of how to get her diagnosed and treated, because I would assume that had she come to the attention of uh, of uh, advanced medical care, uh, that her outcomes and uh, options would have been much better. Kina, do we have any uh, questions coming through the chat? Uh, if not, I have uh, I have one more for Dr. Bruce. Any other questions in the chat so far? I have a question of, for you, Dr. Bruce, about Medicus Healthcare itself. So I'm assuming that is, if I read the uh, description, as a specialized clinic uh, of sorts and uh, operating in a couple of locations in southwestern Uganda. How yeah, has that, right. uh, yeah. If you could describe that and also uh, how that may be a vehicle for uh, building a telemedicine bridge uh, from uh, remote areas, perhaps um, some of those 10,000 clients that, uh, uh, that you had mentioned are served, currently served by those two facilities, and, uh, and what, the, what the future might be look like in that regard, uh, specifically uh, from the, through the lens of Medicus Healthcare. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, so Medicus Healthcare is uh, an idea that my friends and I thought about. And this came because we had been in our, in the system, in, the, in our health care system, and we had fully appreciated the challenges that were. And uh, we didn't want to just look at challenges and say, uh, maybe uh, we've uh, gone to school and we've acquired some skills. We may actually move out and go and get, uh, to get greener pastures. That's what we call it go for greener pastures or go wherever where services are better and we make sure that the solutions and this happens the the very places where we born from our communities our relatives are here our families are here so we 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 were so much concerned by the challenges that we are seeing, the gaps that are uh, evident every other day of our practice. Like you don't have, if you want to help these patients, you don't have what to use. Then every other time you're getting patients with rheumatic maybe an disease and these are young people who have progressed because they've not had someone maybe an equipment but as well as skill. Uh, just as a, a story which is personal. Uh, because I'd been to the facilities that uh, we talked about Kisizi Hospital and this is a hospital much more uh, situated in a rural uh, much more rural area than where medical is. And I had seen so many people present with illnesses which were advanced. And it was clear that if someone had, someone had been there with a skill and maybe with an equipment, a right equipment, they may have made a diagnosis earlier. And early diagnosis, of course, I kept on looking at the economics of having to see these so many people coming with advanced illnesses. And there's not much you can do, but even the little you can, 
you find you're spending more than even the little you have, you're spending a lot. So that became so much of a personal concern. And so uh, when I started, my friends and I, when we started earning, we thought that we needed to save some money to put up startups like Medicus. And so the money would be used for buying equipment and maybe making sure that these startups are to a they get to existence. And because of that burden and the experience we had had and the first hand experience we had had because we had worked in these facilities and appreciated the challenges, then we thought of starting. And so we started these facilities. One uh, is in Kabale and another one is around 100 kilometers away from Kabale. And the one in Kabale seems to be the oldest, which has been for around four years now, and it's picked up. It's able to sustain itself. And of course, we have as well been thinking of uh, ways to uh, sustain it, like novel ideas to make sure that it's sustainable. And those, we have ideas that we're yet to look into and implement. And because of uh, for example, the specific services that we offer, like endoscopy, upper J endoscopy and lower J endoscopy, we happen in uh, a population of 8 million. We have around now three centers, functional centers, endoscopy centers. So you can imagine a population of 8 million having three centers where if at all anyone had an abdominal issue, they that's where those are the just three centers which can offer the services so we've added the two centers now they are four so we are we count now four centers which offer a very important service upper j endoscopy and lower j endoscopy so these still a big population but we feel like we are already creating an impact and of course we've as well uh looked into areas of other non-communicable diseases like hypertension, heart failure, uh, COPD, asthma. So we've looked at uh, implementing like diagnostic spirometry and then uh, systems like electronic systems to aid us to follow up these patients. And we're interested in data collection, which we can later look at and make sense of what seems to be the problem affecting our people. And yeah, now going to the telemedicine, because we are very few uh, skilled personnel in the middle, in like a drop in an ocean, we think that we see challenges every other day, which we think that if at all we are able to interact with colleagues outside, outside there would be willing. Maybe we get a challenging case, then we can take a photo and then we communicate. Maybe it takes minutes and when we get feedback, if I'm doing an echocardiogram, maybe I get something unusual that I've not seen before. I can take a picture, link up with a cardiologist who is at a center somewhere and can give me ideas on how to go on with this kind of scenario. And of course, the many other, I think, very many opportunities that we would be able to benefit from if at all we implemented such a novel uh, strategy like telemedicine in this hard to reach and uh, underserved uh, area of southwestern Uganda. Right. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, thank you for the details on that. And, uh, you know, sounds like lots of possibilities to begin to um, network, you know, various locations and get uh, the capabilities of early detection and early treatment out to many more people, um, you know, in the not too distant uh, future ahead. So, um, um, one additional sort of add on to the earlier question about, um, you know, early detection. 
uh, while we were talking, I entered this patient's case into a specific medical chat bot. Uh, it happens to be Cahoon. Uh, dot com. I'm not mm -hmm. affiliated with them other than I'm familiar with the uh, the chat bot. And it is a uh, chat bot that's white uh, labeled to a number of uh, telemedicine programs and continuing medical education uh, programs around the uh, world. comes out of uh, uh, Israel. And uh, so I put this patient's case into that chat bot. Uh, as a 24-year-old with a uh, history of rectal uh, bleeding, fullness, et cetera, just the basic details alone uh, without any other information such as biopsy or images, uh, just the history alone generated a differential diagnosis um, based on the, if, if the patient had entered this themselves, um, it would have, uh, as it did just a moment ago, pulled up the following most likely diagnosis and uh, diagnoses that put Crohn's disease uh, at the top, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. over 200 articles that support that. It put colorectal cancer in second position and then uh, inflammatory bowel disease in third position. And then in less likely diagnoses, uh, it put in uh, uh, more unusual conditions such as uh, carcinoid uh, tumor, uh, diverticulitis, mm -hmm. which would be somewhat rare also in a, a younger yeah. person yeah. like this, lymphoma, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, polyposis syndrome as well. So uh, mm -hmm. even before test results, just on history alone, it uh, within a matter of seconds mm -hmm. uh, generated this differential. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, um, again, if this had been... Uh, type of technology had been available to close to the patient, perhaps even on a, a smartphone device of some sort uh, in her hands or in the hands of uh, a trusted other family member or um, perhaps a medical professional on the ground yeah. where she was, uh, the likelihood would have been much greater that at least the alarm would have gone off for this patient to come to the attention, um, make the necessary um, maneuvers and trips, if, if necessary, to the big city, right, to get a colonoscopy and get a, a diagnosis, perhaps even a year previously. So, uh, yeah. yeah, looking yeah. forward to, you know, additional dialogue about how to do that on the ground, you know, in uh, medical groups in Uganda and, uh, and and similar environments that, you know, can really begin to build the bridge for uh, bringing health care to people rather than uh, the old model, which is bringing people to health care. So really appreciate your perspective on, on that. Uh, so, Kina, do we have any other questions? Uh, Takers, uh, we've got a few more minutes available for uh, questions, comments. Dr. Bruce. I just see in the box, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute, uh, put it in the chat, or raise your hands, or like any sign, and, we, and you can ask your question. Okay. Well, if not, and uh, hearing none, Dr. Twina Masiko, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, sharing this case. Um, nice to uh, get to know you and looking forward to uh, interacting with you and working with you more in the future. Um, appreciate your time and interest in, in joining us today. And uh, uh, do you have any other uh, comments, um, questions, concerns out there? And uh, Dr. Bruce, uh, uh, again, thank you for joining us today. And uh, Kina, uh, back to you if there isn't anything else. And uh, you can close and uh, appreciate uh, your help. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending today's presentation. And thank you so much, Dr. Bruce, for your very informative presentation. And our next Global Grand Rounds will be on February 7th, if I'm right. And we will follow up with an email and keep an eye out for our emailing list for more information on that. This presentation was recorded and Dr. Bruce's presentation on his patient will be on our YouTube channel. 
and the playback speed will allow you to control how fast you want it to go. So if you are interested in rewatching the lecture, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. And once again, thank you so much for attending and we will be closing this grand rounds today. Mm -hmm.